Welcome back to Fight Network. Cody Saftik here with you. Bellator 159 goes down Friday, July 22nd from Mulvane, Kansas. And of course, what card in Kansas would ever be complete without Dave the Caveman Rickles? Dave, what's going on, man? What's up, man? Did you, did you clear this interview with my personal security? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was uh, pretty hard, let me tell you. Yeah, the two dinosaurs, yeah, they're pretty easy to fool, though. Well, well you had me fooled, because, I mean, I, I thought you were a Kansas boy through and through, and, I mean, uh, went through your security detail in Kansas. Turns out you've been hanging out in Colorado with the Elevation Fight Team. So let me ask you, I mean, how did that opportunity come up? <laughs> ask away. Uh, yeah, how did you end up in Colorado? I mean, great team over there, good training bodies. Obviously, you're working with TJ Dillashaw, the former UFC champ, amongst a host of other notable guys. So how did that move come together for you in the first place? Man, it came together. Um, a friend of mine from the Midwest area, um, Drew Dover, um, UFC fighter uh, currently, um, skilled fighter, um, he invited me out there because we're friends and he wanted to train. And um, then once I checked the place out and started to uh, really get to know the coaches and really get to know a lot of the fighters out there like Matt Brown, Neil Magny, um, Daniel Hooker was out there for a little bit. Uh, um, man, there's just a lot of extremely talented guys with a lot of focus, and uh, that's the kind of thing I want to surround myself with. And how much is that changing your game? I mean, you've always been known as a very potent, sometimes reckless finisher, and it seems like lately we kind of got a different caveman, Rickles, who's kind of emerging, and I even saw on your Facebook the words poised and patient, and I thought to myself, Do, are we seeing a new caveman on the rise? Um, yeah, you know... We're definitely seeing a new caveman, and whether or not that's – it's a translation of in and out of the cage, man. Like, I'm growing up as an individual, as a father uh, to two beautiful children, man. So so I've had to change the caveman ways a little bit, you know? Not, not quite as much debauchery, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but um, – yeah, um, I changed a lot of my, my my fighting game as well because I just like to uh, I like to look around. I like to to watch um, kind of as this game is evolving, uh, what champions are made of, and and you you stated a prime example of that earlier. Um, I really like I would just sit back during training. Sometimes I I just watch T.J. Dillashaw like the way that he carries himself, um, the way that he talks to himself uh, during training, the way. That he goes about it, you know, and you can just feel that championship aura from him, and um, that's just something I'm trying to mimic and, um, and take notes from. Now, people always say, you know, big stars like George St. Pierre, and he obviously fights the, fights the smart way, and you're a huge fan favorite a lot because of your fight style and what you bring to the game. How do you kind of find that balance between being that huge fan favorite who delivers these huge performances, but also being that smarter fighter who, you know, sees the opportunities instead of just forcing them? Yeah, you know, that, and it is a it is a strange balance, and it, and it's really hard to get out there, especially when when I'm so used to fighting the way that I fight. You know, um, one of the problems that I've been having um, is you know fighting super intelligent, training really good, um, feeling all these really good improvements, and then not being able to do that in the cage because I let my uh, emotions get to me or. Um, you know, I let the crowd get to me. I get all riled up and want to go all caveman on a mother. But, uh, yeah. So, so the, the trick is balancing and, and balancing it in the cage when, when I really need it. Well, that's a, yeah, I'm sure it is a very hard balance to find because speaking of going caveman on people, that John Alessio fight, I remember very clearly this win is yours for the taking and you went full caveman on him and led to a no contest. But now, as you mentioned, now you're training smarter and now you're getting Melvin Gillard and you're someone who, you've already fought the best guys in Bellator. You've already fought guys that are at a very high level. So Melvin, to you, I mean, is, is he just a veteran guy with a big name or is this, you know, one of the tougher fights that you've been forced to deal with? You know, uh... That's the same. I think that uh, you know, as a fighter, at least myself, you know, um, when I when I get an opponent, um, I look at I just look at where he's really good at and how it matches up to me. And um, I think that uh, Melvin Gillard, the best bet in this fight, is coming out and being that young assassin, coming uh, and trying to take my head off. Um, he's going to try to overwhelm me, but I think that he's going to find out that. Uh, my violence is much stronger than his violence, and um, yeah, I foresee his doom. 
a lot, a lot of people that have came came down to Mulvane, Kansas, have uh, met their doom at your hands. And in fact, with including this fight, six of your last fights have taken place in Mulvane, Kansas. Is this something you relish, you know, being able to put it on for the hometown crowd, having your friends and family coming out? Or would you rather travel a little bit and be the villain for a change? No, hell no. I love being the hero. Man, I watched too many goddamn superhero movies when I was a kid. I want to be a Ninja Turtle. I want to be Superman. I want to be Batman. Um, I love fighting in front of the Kansas crowd because I, you know, a, a part of the reason I started doing my walkouts and all that was because um, when I went out of town for different fights, I, I wanted people to cheer for me. I wanted them to go, oh, my God, what's this guy doing? Oh, what? Okay, cool. Let's cheer for that guy. Because uh, in early Bellator, a lot of people didn't know who to cheer for. They didn't know uh, the fighters personally. You know, they didn't know who you were. So I think it was a good way to show who I am and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, man, I, I love embracing that crowd. And, uh, um, of course, you know, being that hero out there, you know, being a hero for the Kansas crowd that night, going out there and killing the villain. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And how much pressure do you put on yourself now to kind of have these sweet walkouts? I mean, you're someone who's lone, known for almost legendary stuff at this point. But, I mean, even just whether it's coming out with the with the dinosaur, which I'm sure you're getting tagged in all those T-Rex videos nowadays, whether it's coming out with the car or even the, just that sweet leopard print suit, do, or do you always plan on having something in store? Yeah, you know, it's just... It's really hard to get away from it now for two reasons. I'll tell you why. Um, my hometown expects it. Okay. Definitely here at the hometown, there's expectations to be had. Caveman has, uh, caveman needs to be caveman. He needs to do his thing, come out. And, uh, and that means the second the crowd sees me, they need to be entertained and they need to be shown a good time. Number two reason, believe it or not, these walkouts really do call me down they get me i'm so used to doing them that like uh if i didn't it would feel strange when i was walking out you know so um it actually eases me uh, eases me a little bit um uh, before i get into the cage it gets my adrenaline down a little bit um and helps me focus well, that's exactly it. People always say, you know, you train hard. The fight's supposed to be the easy part. But you see these guys, you know, stress in the back and have anxiety in the back. And you seem like you're always just having a fun time. And I'm sure the walkouts are probably a part of that. Now, you're a very highly ranked lightweight in the division. I mean, prior to that, you were actually doing pretty good as a welterweight. But now you call 155 your home. And being that Michael Chandler has just, you know, recaptured that Bellator title, he's someone you've already fought twice. Does that make it extra difficult to kind of work back into a title fight with him? Or is that something you're not even concerned about at this point? Yeah, I'm not really too concerned with it right now. I think that there's, you know, I'm always, I think there's a lot, a lot of really fun and cool matchups for me. You know, Josh Thompson, Benson Henderson, uh, even Mike Campos would be a really good one, or, or, or <laughs> Derek Campos. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm not in a rush, man. Um, of course, I am standing on a road, which is the yellow brick road, son. And those those bricks lead to a gold belt. And um, I've just got to keep moving forward. I've got to keep moving forward, uh, whether it's slowly or at a run. Um, I don't care when Bellator gives me the opportunity, but I definitely want to make it to, to another title shot. Now, final question for you. Let's say perfect scenario. You're able to get that win over Melvin Gillard. Bellator Brass comes up to you and they say, listen, we want the rematch with you and Patricky Pitbull Freite. But you have an option here. Dave Caveman Rickles has an option. You can either fight him straight up or you can fight him sporting that sweet mustache that he had against Chandler. How much more difficult it is when a guy's got a menacing uh, mustache like that on? That is a pretty menacing mustache, but I actually want to do a ladder match. Like, can we even do a ladder match against Patricky Pitbull? Because that would be a lot of fun. And I think the crowd would really enjoy it. And, hell, I've never done any form of pro, pro wrestling. But I think I could pull it off. And with a sweet mustache like that, I think he'd look pretty good out there, too. Yeah, but what if his brother came in and hoisted him up on his shoulders? It's like a two-on-one. Like, if it's going to be oh, pro wrestling, you need someone you're... who's got your back, too, here. I did not foresee that, but you're exactly right. That would definitely happen. I'll get jumped by the Petriki Pitbull brothers, man. You wouldn't be the first um, one to get yeah, jumped so by Yeah, so I got to recruit. 
who do you think I should recruit on my team? Like, if there was a tag team match in Bellator, who do you think would be my best bet? You know what? I'm not going to lie. Maybe it's because I'm a super fan, but you were saying Dan Hooker was up at Elevation. I'm always down for some oh my Hooker action. God. <laughs> Hell yes. I will definitely take Daniel Hooker. Uh, and we will stone cold Steve Austin some bitches and put him in some stunners. And yeah, we take the belt. I'm pretty sure we're, we could be the best tag team that has never been mentioned before. Well, especially in the ladder match. I mean, he's like six foot one. I mean, he wouldn't take a, maybe just a couple steps and he can snatch it. Can you believe it? Can you believe that guy fights 145? I'm shocked. It's, it's insane. And there's another question for you. I mean, uh, how is that cut to 155? I mean, you're what, six feet tall fighting at 155? You used to fight at 170. Now that they got a kind of got new weight cutting rules come into effect, do you think 55s are home or do you envision a move up to 170 in the future? Um, you know, my vision is, right now is definitely on the 155. Um, I've made a lot of changes, you know, it's been very gradual the changes I've made but they've all started to accumulate you know I'm starting to see like a different body um, from the hard training that I've been putting in over these last three or four camps you know um, so I'm starting to get muscles where I haven't seen muscles before and veins where I haven't seen veins and uh yeah, I mean, the weight cut's going great. Like, it's basically about the same as it's always been. But it's always rough for me, man. I, You know, I think that uh, ideally I'm just one of those strange people who needs a, a middle weight class. Like, I need a 162. But because I always feel, um, you know, too small at 170 when I get a big, strong wrestler on me. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It just sucks, dude. <laughs> Well, it's always one thing at a time. First thing on that agenda will obviously be that fight at Belcher 159 on July 22nd, taking on Melvin Gillard. And then after that, potentially 162-pound weight class. And then after that, potentially a ladder match with him and Daniel Hooker. Dave Rickles,